Rob is the uh, founder uh, and CEO of the Institute for Energy Research, which is in uh, Houston, I believe. Uh, or, hmm? Oh, it is in, oh, it's in Washington, but you're in Houston. I knew someone was down there where the oil is. Uh, and uh, he's also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, Competitive Enterprise Institute, a visiting uh, fellow at the Institute for Economic Affairs over in London, and he's just got a whole list of places where he uh, does good stuff. He's authored seven books on energy, history, and uh, policy. And uh, one of the things some of you might know is that uh, Rob Bradley worked for uh, Ken Lay at Enron for many years and uh, has uh, uh, since then g given commentaries. We have, uh, have a piece in the New Individuals you can find on our website about exactly what went wrong at uh, Enron. And he's one of the most insightful guys of really taking a look at what real capitalism is, what crony capitalism is, and so forth. So uh, I can't think of anyone better today to talk about political capitalism than Rob Bradley. So Rob, take it away. Thank you very much. Is this on? Good. Well, it's great to be back. Uh, this is the fourth time I've spoken at this conference out of the last five years. And I always try to come up with something new so uh, Will Thomas will uh, consider me. So um, uh, this talk uh, this afternoon, uh, is titled Political Capitalism, uh, Warnings in Reality. And um, I have given a series of talks at uh, Atlas Society events um, on the themes of uh, best practices, free market capitalism versus uh, its opposite. Uh, and this is certainly a theme that uh, uh, Ayn Rand recognized, and you see it in uh, Atlas Shrugged. Um, Another uh, uh, reason for giving this talk is I'm very active writing uh, essays and blogs uh, in the area of uh, political versus free market capitalism, and Roger Donway is uh, giving me all sorts of help. Is Roger here? Roger is working on his presentation. He's going to have every word down. I think he's tomorrow afternoon. But my presentation this afternoon uh, might serve as a foundation for two talks that we have tomorrow, uh, one by uh, Professor Hicks, Stephen Hicks, on um, uh, entrepreneurship and objectivist principles applied to business, and also the uh, uh, Aaron Day talk on uh, is it time for Atlas to shrug? I think that's going to fit in uh, pretty well with the foundation that I'm going to uh, try to present uh, this afternoon. Um, last year at this conference, I gave a talk on how Ayn Rand treated energy in all sorts of different dimensions in Atlas Shrugged. And one way she dealt with it was with, um, uh, well, she dealt with government intervention uh, in a variety of ways. Um, in Atlas Shrugged, there's the Bureau of Economic Planning and Natural Resources. She talks about the excise profits tax. Uh, as if she knew about the windfall profit stacks of 1980. Uh, there's price controls, and when you have price controls, you have shortages. When you have shortages, you have the government to step in uh, to allocate short supply, uh, conservation uh, regulation. Uh, there's shortages and breakdowns, uh, the planned chaos of, uh, of von Mises. Um, uh, there's the blame game by regulators, problems happen from regulation, and it's the uh, business actors who are blamed and not the intervention itself. And also there's public utility uh, regulation that comes into play in Atlas Rug. So uh, Rand had a very sophisticated idea of the dynamics of government intervention in the economy uh, when she wrote Atlas Shrugged. And I think a lot of this knowledge came from World War II planning, where we had price allocation control shortages and the rest of it. I think it had to have been that real world experience uh, that she saw in not only uh, some conversations and studies she did of um, uh, conversations with Ludwig von Mises and uh, her study of uh, Austrian economics. The other thing that Rand was very good on, even though some people forget this when they see her defend business as the persecuted minority, is that Rand differentiated between free market business and 
uh, uh, what we call today crony capitalism or uh, rent seeking by business. And here's a couple of uh, quotations. Uh, the, the second quotation is from a letter she wrote uh, during uh, the writing of uh, Atlas Shrugged where she says, quote, in my new book I glorify the real kind of productive free market businessman in a way he has never been glorified before. I present him as the most heroic type of human being, but I make mincemeat out of the kind of businessman who calls himself a middle of the rotor and talks about a mixed economy, the kind that runs to government for assistance, subsidies, legislation, and regulation. Boom. The three parts of uh, crony capitalism or rent seeking are a, uh, a check written on the uh, U.S. Treasury from taxpayers, uh, particular regulation, uh, uh, and or a provision in the tax code that's uh, uh, preferential. Uh, I've written a, uh, 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 Ed mentioned uh, I worked at Enron, and Ed, you can shorten your introduction next time and just say that uh, Rob Bradley worked at Enron, he's the smartest guy in the room. You don't need to go through uh, any credentials. Uh, that's it. Uh, but um, I'm working on a, a trilogy on political capitalism inspired by the rise and fall of Enron, the first book on worldview, the second book on history, and the third book will look at uh, Enron on a day-to-day, month-to-month, quarter-to-quarter basis through the 17-year history of the company. And I'm convinced that if Ayn Rand wanted to write a novel on a corporation using all her themes, something building upon Atlas Shrugged, sort of a combination of the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, she could not have done better than to write a book about what actually happened at Enron. And this is a lecture in itself, but uh, 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 Ken Lay was a masterful rent seeker, and he was the, uh, um, the, really one of the ultimate second-handers. He tried to make the company something for everyone, and it ended up being nothing. Uh, my book, um, my worldview book, Capitalism at Work, good copies are still available. Um, I got a nice endorsement from Gabriel Coco, who popularized the term political capitalism uh, in uh, so a couple of books he wrote in the 1960s, where as a new left socialist Marxist-oriented historian, he looks at cap the history of American capitalism and he sees all the rent-seeking, all the political, the big, the political side of capitalism, and um, uh, he determines that businessmen uh, weren't passive victims of much intervention, but they were the aggressor. They were the, uh, the force that, that uh, worked with government, often leading government to get uh, preferential uh, intervention. Uh, and he gave my book a nice quote here, fascinating, comprehensive, far surpassing my own history of political capitalism done in the, in the 1960s. But there's another quote uh, from my mother who says, five or six pages gets me right to sleep. A little humility is good. Actually, my mother's in her mid-80s, and it, she goes to bed with the bowl of ice cream in my book, so I don't really have a chance. Uh, but if she uh, says that um, reading the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, uh, you know, seven, eight pages gets her right to sleep, I'm really going to get worried, but maybe, maybe not. The perils of intervention. Uh, Government is coercion. It is the initiation of force. And I'm amazed at uh, how many textbooks on government don't even define government uh, in this way, that government is a monopoly on force within a certain geographical area. It's a very dangerous uh, institution uh, and a necessary evil at best. Um, a key insight of social science study in economics is that there's a natural market order with private property, uh, voluntary exchange, and the rule of law, and that central planning is, as Mises would say, really plan chaos. Uh, the third point, and this is a very important point that I'll focus uh, on this afternoon, is that government intervention goes to the organized, the special interest at the expense of the less organized. And there's a phrase that uh, you probably heard before, government goes to those who show up. 
Uh, and with all that's being done with the Tea Party movement, with, uh, with, with uh, Charles Koch's philanthropy, with the, uh, um, uh, all the nonprofit, free market nonprofit groups that have proliferated, uh, I, you know, we can say now that unlike before, we are showing up at these debates. And my uh, institute was, used to be just me out of my house. A, uh, uh, it was called in print a think bucket rather than a think tank. But we uh, have a Washington office, 10 full-time employees, uh, uh, several million dollars a year budget. We've gotten real big real quick. And one of the things that we ultimately want to do is to work ourselves out of a job. Uh, if I can, if we, if IR can get back to me in the, at the house, the economy is going to be doing a lot uh, better. Um, why big government? Uh, here's a quote from Milton Friedman, and I am going to speak on uh, Friedman's contributions to Liberty Sunday morning. Um, he he has a quotation: "The two greatest enemies of free enterprise in the United States have been, on the one hand, <clears throat> my fellow intellectuals, and on the other hand." the business corporations of this country. Wow. Uh, we, we recognize how the intellectual class has been against capitalism, sort of a smartest guys in the room problem there, among other things, but business corporations. And Rand uh, saw this again and again, and she would complain about uh, uh, businessmen who were, uh, you know, are not uh, in favor of free enterprise, or they're for in free enterprise in a very abstract level, but they're against it when it really comes down to their own business if they can, uh, um, if they're in some sort of trouble. I read a treatise on uh, oil and gas intervention in the United States at the beginning, well, some years ago. That's me, believe it or not. Um, and uh, one of the quotations uh, that really grabbed me was this one, there were as many objections as there are differing economic interests. In other words, the public policy position of a business depends on the calculator. And I almost brought out my calculator from Houston, Texas, all the way to have it here. But can you all, anyone have a calculator on them? Raise it. I guess we can do everything uh, uh, by other means. Um, it's sort of like, what do we think of this? Well, hold on. We like it or we don't like it. That is the morality of business because uh, so many other businesses are doing it and it's, uh, uh, it, it's almost uh, amoral. Uh, a, a second quotation from uh, Alfred Kahn, who was very involved in airline deregulation uh, back in the 70s. One interference with competition necessitates another and yet another, and an industry of rugged individualists becomes more and more tightly enmeshed with the government to which they originally turned in hope of protecting themselves from competition. And Kahn had uh, the oil and gas industry in mind in uh, particular. Um, Gosh, uh, the dynamics of intervention, uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, noticed in, um, uh, in, a, in, his di in his dissertation at the beginning of his career, Theory of Money and Credit, he talked about how price controls lead to allocation controls. Or government uh, monopoly, go printing money creates inflation, inflation leads to price controls, price controls lead to shortages that lead to allocation controls, and it spirals uh, on and on. And there's uh, some terms you can use, and you can go through an industry that's heavily regulated, and you can figure out which intervention was sort of the causal, the original intervention, the initiating intervention, and then all the cumulative intervention that comes uh, from it. And I've done this uh, in oil and gas, and it's quite a, it gets quite complicated. And old Karl Marx going, hey, you know, if you do it enough, uh, hey, we, we, we'll get there, you know. And uh, uh, old Carl somewhere yesterday was doing this, I think, uh, regarding the United States Supreme Court decision. Um, the Federal Reserve Act, uh, getting from the, from the beginning to uh, the bailout, uh, you know, here's a, a schematic of how complicated it gets. And you can do this for all the industry. But you get the point here. One intervention leads to another. Uh, and Mises said, look, you either have to deregulate and go to a market, or 
you intervene more and more in the market, uh, 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 turn more into uh, state planning. Uh, Gabriel Coco, who I mentioned before, his books in the 1960s, that from a new left perspective, uh, uh, documented how uh, much of the government intervention was business-sponsored, business-enabled, uh, and he resurrected the term political capitalism, which he defines here as, quote, the utilization of political outlets to attain conditions of stability, predictability, and security to allow corporations reasonable profits over the long run. And from the Marxist perspective, you had the business people always teaming up with government uh, uh, because of the, the inherent instability of business conditions uh, under capitalism and therefore um, uh, something other than capitalism uh, uh, needed to uh, be in place. This is sort of the Marxist socialist uh, view of history and why capitalism inherently fails. Lots of fallacies there, but we'll say that for another day. Uh, political capitalism and Encyclopedia of Capitalism here, uh, I wrote a piece and I defined it as a private property market system shaped by special government intervention where regulation subsidies or tax code provisions are less reformer driven, that means from the outside, from an uh, interest group uh, or the government itself, and more business driven, in other words, uh, profit, profit driven. Uh, there are two avenues of business success under profit loss. There's a free market means where entrepreneurs provide a good or service in an open market under voluntary conditions. The political means is where government a restriction or favor provides a margin of success beyond what consumer preference alone would provide. Market entrepreneurship versus political entrepreneurship. When you think of all the terms for political capitalism, and there are more, but what is a term that just since the bailout in recent years has come to the top? Anybody? Cronyism, crony capitalism. Uh, and the left and right are using this. Uh, and I went on the internet and just sort of grabbed down some images for crony capitalism and there's a lot to choose from. Uh, and this is a, a common ground between uh, left and right. Uh, uh, it's a common criticism toward the big government status quo. What uh, Ed Hudgens uh, talk, t talked about as the, uh, what, the duopoly, the sort of the two-party uh, system. Uh, some more. Uh, uh, the, sort of a funny cartoon. Corporations are in bed with government. This makes a lot of sense. This makes no sense, so we need more government. Oh my gosh. You know, how do you get the left to look at uh, GE uh, in Duke, and particularly Enron. Uh, Enron, the left, the, the mainstream view, and it was reiterated on the 10th anniversary of Enron's bankruptcy, is that capitalism failed. This is, uh, this is uh, greed, that uh, Jeff Skilling was some sort of an Ayn Rand uh, uh, hero, and, and the, the truth is the exact uh, opposite. Um, Warren Buffett comes into play here. I love this cartoon. Uh, she is not Warren Buffett's secretary, but she is smart enough to know when you are in the tax shelter business advocating for higher taxes on your rich clients is not only shrewd, it's crony capitalism. There you go, there you go. Um, back to Enron just for a minute. Uh, all of Enron's profit centers had something to do with special government favor whether it was uh, OPEC XM financing, taxpayer-based financing for uh, um, asset development in developing countries. Uh, Enron had eight profit centers around the whole global warming issue and pricing carbon dioxide. Uh, Enron was a leading company in the U.S. Uh, pushing for uh, cap and trade. Uh, mandatory open access with pipelines and uh, electric transmission. Uh, that allowed uh, Enron to be a market maker, buying and selling gas and electricity. Uh, and during this time, Enron, uh, uh, Ken Lay is singing the praises of the free market and fooling a lot of people, but it's, uh, it's, it's quite a story. So in my conclusion is that Enron and Ken Lay would be unknown to history in a market economy. It was only in the mixed economy where you have 
Dr. Ken Lay, PhD economist, uh, heavy with Washington experience, big picture guy, uh, that was able to rise to the top in the business world. And F.A. Hayek has a famous essay, Why the Worst Get on Top, talking about in totalitarian regimes, uh, 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 why the worst get on top. In a much milder instance here, uh, uh, in a mixed economy, that can allow the worst to get to the top. The, man, the person with, quote, Washington ability, as uh, RAN uh, outlines in, or states in Atlas Shrugged. Uh, the whole green energy thing is coming back to haunt Obama. Uh, another green uh, energy company defaulted on a DOE loan uh, just yesterday. The list uh, grows and grows. A little cartoon here, how green energy works. Um, See, you give me your green, and I give you the taxpayer's green. Uh, you know, there, there you go. Now, the theory of political capitalism, uh, there's a couple of parts here. One, it begins with the primacy of the economic. In other words, we like money. Businesses like to make money and avoid losing money, okay? And we're in a profit-driven, loss-minimization world. Second point, in the free market, under capitalist reality, as Joseph Schumpeter uh, described it. We have a lot of competition and creative destruction. This idea that there's not uh, much competition in an open market is, is ludicrous. It's quite the opposite. And the Marxist and socialist historians looked at this and said, oh, look, there's too much competition. It's unstable. They make losses. They have to practice imperialism to get to foreign markets to try to make money, and it all fails. The socialists uh, and, the, um, uh, and the Marxists saw uh, the market is really too competitive and unstable, but we can recognize that there's creative destruction and there's a lot of profit making going on. Indeed, if you have economic growth, there's more profits and losses uh, in the aggregate. Uh, but it's tough out there. And, and folks that have worked in business, and uh, you know, most of us have, sometimes those Monday morning staff meetings are, are pretty brutal. It's, it's not easy, because your stupid competitor over there has, you know, with their insane cost cutting, is doing all these things you don't like. That's just the way it is. Um, and the, the third and fourth point of the theory of political capitalism is that there's a supply side uh, there's the economics of politics, where the politicians have something to give, and there's the demand side, where businessmen uh, are in distress and need uh, government favor. Business will rent seek. Uh, what are these favors? Uh, here's a, a list of them. Import restrictions. Uh, protectionism is uh, the most prominent in the history of uh, the modern world. Price supports, a price floor. Uh, grant protection, a license a, uh, to, uh, uh, to provide a good or a service, uh, can be exclusive uh, permit, franchise, or license, or a number of people uh, or businesses can get them. Loan guarantees, uh, we know all about that. Antitrust laws, many more private suits and public suits. And uh, the antitrust laws have really become an instrument uh, where certain businesses uh, use uh, the law to uh, uh, compete against other businesses. Uh, subsidies, uh, you know, just cash grants, DOE grants, uh, and quality standards or efficiency standards, uh, where you have certain companies that specialize in more efficient uh, appliances, let's say, uh, trying to make them stricter because they know they're uh, um, getting a competitive advantage over competitors less able to uh, uh, produce uh, that particular uh, good. The bootleggers and Baptist theory that uh, uh, has been a very useful contribution by Bruce Yandel. Uh, I think he first came up with this in the uh, early 80s. But uh, uh, basically, a lot of profit-seeking business, they can't do it by themselves, OK? They can't make a case to the voters or to the government who's interested in uh, how people will perceive the intervention, saying, oh, God, we need this. You know, we need more profits. No, they team up uh, with nonprofit groups or the, uh, the so-called Baptist, uh, the public interest group that wants the same thing for a different reason. And we see this all the time, let's say, with energy policy, where 
green companies are teaming up with environmental groups. Uh, they go back and forth. And uh, Enron was a master, and uh, Enron received a number of awards from environmental groups, including some at the Kyoto uh, Protocol uh, meeting in December 1997. Um, so it's the, uh, the marriage of high-flown values and narrow interests. And it, uh, 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 Bruce Yandel noticed this as a regulator back in the 80s, and it's certainly uh, true today. Enron is imploding, and Ken Lay is out meeting with uh, uh, Jesse Jackson at a, a Houston a Chamber of Commerce meeting, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, who's a bootlegger, who's a Baptist? Uh, maybe they're both uh, more bootleggers than we uh, realize. Um, political capitalism in practice, it's something that's been uh, noticed by all sorts of uh, uh, top historians and economists. Uh, Th Thomas McGraw, retired from Harvard in Profits of Regulation, very influential book in the, in the 80s, quote, overall the conclusion ap appears inescapable that regulation in America has more often functioned as a protective advice rather than a promotional or developmental one. Um, the second quote, capitalism's biggest political enemies are not the firebrand trade unionists spew spewing a very against the system, but the executives in pinstripe suits extolling the virtues of competitive markets with every breath while attempting to extinguish them with every action. And one businessman put it, uh, we like competition for our inputs, but we don't like competition for our outputs. I'll go, all right. Uh, GE, uh, you know, with the rise of Obama, uh, the, the rent seekers, the political capitalists, just, you know, all of a sudden it was okay to come out and say it. Uh, um, and, and GE is uh, one of the very bad uh, corporate uh, actors. Uh, and CEO uh, Jeffrey Immelt said, quote, the interaction between government and business will change forever. This is in their annual report. In a reset economy, the government will be a regulator and also an industry policy champion, a financier, and a key partner. Uh, and then from Big Pharma, that uh, uh, was one of the reasons the health care, the Affordable Health Care Act was passed uh, uh, several years ago. Quote, this is not the 1990s when the industry was playing defense, that is, with Hillary Care. We're playing offense. We're at the table, okay? Um, uh, this is bad stuff. Uh, the more businesses, businesses that do this, the more the competitors have to do it. And business amoralism, I actually found this in a textbook, a managerial economics textbook. So this is what the... Uh, the MBA students are, uh, are, are, are learning, quote, the economic theory of regulation is based on those who demand regulation, the special interests, and those who supply it, politicians. Special interest groups who are better able, who are better off by the regulation will lobby in its favor, whereas those harmed will lobby against it. Politicians are made better off by brokering these transactions. To develop strategies that both create value and capture value, it is not enough to build a better ma mousetrap. You must limit entry by competitors. The most direct way to limit competition is a government regulation limiting entry. A less direct method is a government regulation that imposes a cost on certain competitors and potential entrants. Textbook. You know, that's how far we've come. Uh, but we can't say we uh, haven't been warned against it. Uh, Adam Smith uh, saw it very clearly, and the second quotation here is in a letter from uh, 1785 where he, he uh, writes uh, to, to a friend, quote, I expect all the bad consequences from the chambers of commerce and manufacturers establishing in different parts of the country which your grace seems to foresee. The regulations of commerce are commonly dictated by those who are most interested to deceive and impose upon uh, the public. Uh, James Madison was uh, very worried about, quote, the violence of faction, where men of, of, of factious tempers, of local prejudices, or a sinister design made by intrigue, by corruption, or other means, first obtain the suffrages and then betray the interest of the people, the special uh, interest. Uh, Andrew Jackson, there's lots of quotes here. And there's some early American uh, political economists, 19th century economists, who um, 
uh, really nailed it with special interests. They saw exactly what was uh, going on. They gave examples and they went through hypothetical examples. One hypothetical example, well, I'll, it gets a little complicated, so I'll say that one. Um, uh, William Graham Sumner and Simon Newcomb uh, were the two. Uh, and a gentleman named Arthur Bentley in a, a 1908 book, and I read these books so you don't have to. Uh, that's a, that's a good news here. But uh, he's really the father of public choice uh, economics, uh, what James Buchanan and, um, uh, and others uh, have uh, won Nobel Prizes uh, with. Now the left, they complain too about all the special interests. Here's a quote from Al Gore. The, the influence of special interests is now at an extremely unhealthy level. And it's to the point where it's virtually impossible for participants in the current political system to enact any meaningful change without first seeking and gaining permission from the largest commercial interests who are the most affected by the proposed change. Well, the environmental groups have been working. It's an explicit strategy. They understand political capitalism forward and backwards, and they know they have to co-op business to give their uh, reforms uh, a chance. It's uh, the bootleggers and Baptists. Uh, Hillary Clinton uh, said this uh, uh, several years ago. People say all the time we can't pick winners and losers. Well then, fine. Let's take every single dollar of subsidy out of the federal tax code. Get rid of it all. Let's have a level playing field where nobody gets a penny in subsidies. Here, here. Okay? Now maybe uh, candidate Romney can use this quote against uh, uh, his uh, opponent. Well, toward uh, heroic capitalism, and uh, we're going to hear a lot about this tomorrow from uh, Professor Hicks. I'll just mention a, a few things here. Uh, but basically, the the win-win the, the here is that rather than all, having all this government intervention, much of it business-sponsored, and going through the dreaded business cycle, the boom and bust, uh, the artificial boom from, art, uh, from easy credit policies, easy monetary policies, and favoritism and subsidies for certain industries such as uh, uh, home building. Uh, rather than that, where you get very little economic growth out of the whole cycle, don't we want sustainable progress where there are a lot of ups and downs uh, um, uh, within creative destruction but overall, there's a lot more growth. That's what we want, and that's why we want to uh, reduce government intervention. Uh, the, the case for heroic capitalism, or best practices, or the science of success, as Charles Koch would call it, uh, is there in some of our leading uh, scholars. Uh, Adam Smith, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Um, how much time? About 10. Okay. Uh, in the Theory of Moral Sentiments, there's a lot of insight uh, one insight of Adam Smith that I'll share, and I think of it a lot with Enron, is Adam Smith talked about the need for us all to be successful, to have an impartial observer. And often it's our spouse, our significant other, someone that can say, you know, you're not doing it right. You're full of it. Uh, because particularly when you're successful, you have a lot of yes people around you uh, who just, you know, oh, you're great, you're great. Business as usual, just keep going. Uh, and Adam Smith said, we all have a tendency to overrate ourselves, particularly when we're in prosperity, and we need uh, um, an, quote, impartial observer uh, uh, that can uh, help us uh, uh, notice the thing, the problems uh, that we have. And Charles Koch has a term called overcoming success. His point is, when you're successful, you are creating an environment, or you're tempting yourself where you're going to be less successful later on, where if you're less successful to begin with, chances are you're going to be more successful uh, uh, in the future. So overcoming success is a, is a very tough uh, a thing. Samuel Smiles. How many of you in this room have heard of Samuel Smiles or have read a book? Some have. A lot of you haven't. He's sort of the Adam Smith of applied capitalism. He wrote a book called Self-Help in 1865 which is the beginning of the self-help movement that we see today all over the place. Um, and he had lots of do's and don'ts and case studies of people who were successful 
And this book was written for people that were, rather than going out and uh, tilling the soil, living from hand to mouth, people are actually going inside a, uh, an enclosed area, an office, and they're working with other people in an office, okay? Well, how do you succeed? What are the do's and don'ts? And uh, his wisdom of the ages uh, applies uh, to Enron and all sorts of things, and that's a, a real classic. Best uh, practices capitalism. And Ayn Rand uh, numerous insights on uh, respecting objective reality, uh, uh, seeing it a as it is and not uh, being a second-hand or a crony and all the rest of it. Uh, and in my book, Capitalism at Work, I have chapters on each of these three individuals and apply their lessons to modern corporate controversies. Uh, two other books of note uh, in this genre, uh, The Heroic Enterprise by John Hood that came out uh, oh, some 15, 20 years ago, and The Science of Success by Charles Koch, which I think is a real classic. It's a, it's a small book, a short book. It's really packed with insight, but um, I really do believe that he has taken the science of liberty and taken numerous insights of it, and understanding such things as creative destruction and objective reality has turned it into um, uh, a number of lessons to help us succeed, not only for profits, but uh, non-profits. Uh, back to the heroic enterprise by John Hood, he asks these questions uh, uh, regarding a, a moral, just, good, uh, heroic enterprise. <clears throat> Are corporations obtaining their profits through force or fraud? The first question. Are corporations putting the investments at their disposal to the most economically productive use? Are they profitable? Uh, are corporate uh, managers uh, fulfilling their contractual obligation to shareholders uh, and, uh, you know, really maximizing profits? Are they competing <coughs> successfully for workers and customers by being innovative? Are corporations um, uh, upholding and defending the principles of voluntary exchange, free markets, and societal division of labor on which their existence is predicated? Corporations need to. Uh, uh, to do that, and we'll hear a lot more about that tomorrow, I'm sure, from uh, Professor Hicks. Uh, back to the uh, science of success, uh, the, the case study of Coke Industries is, is, is just uh, fascinating. Uh, if they were a uh, public company, they'd be uh, probably 10 to 15 in size in the United States. How, that's how uh, big they are. I think they're number two of private companies, um, but they've never made a loss. Uh, uh, and they, uh, they're conglomerate. You learn in business school that, you know, conglomerates just can't uh, succeed. You have to have a very narrow focus and, well, gosh, they have entered, they're in more businesses and they have exited more businesses than uh, any other company you can think of and they're very successful. And the common denominator uh, is uh, his uh, market-based management. But there's a part of market-based management that's really important. It's called principled entrepreneurship, and they trademarked the term. And it's defined as maximizing long-term profitability for the business by creating real value in society while always acting lawfully and with integrity. Real value means the economic means, the free market means, and not the political means of rent seeking. That is what is implicit in here. And what's very important about that is that Milton Friedman, his um, a uh, very famous article on corporate social responsibility back in 1970 where he sort of shocked the, uh, shocked the world and uh, raised a debate by saying that the social responsibility of business is to make a profit. Well, that's great, but guess what? What if it's with rent seeking, okay? What if you're maximizing your uh, return to shareholders during your fiduciary uh, duty by seeking a tariff? Well, Friedman was asked that, and this is a very long quote that I won't uh, read, but he basically said, yeah, can't blame them. Yeah, they're doing it for their stockholders. So Koch's, uh, Charles Koch's principled entrepreneurship really goes a step beyond Friedman's profit maximization model to set a standard for uh, free market adherence. So few real capitalists, and I think I'll end with this one. Oh, Lee Raymond at ExxonMobil, oh, was he tough. Oh, the environmentalists hated him. He called it like it was. I think Rand would have loved him. 
Uh, John Allison of bb and Corporation, and John Allison has a new job now, uh, uh, the president of the Cato Institute, and that's very exciting for the movement, and Charles Koch, who I've uh, talked about. So, uh, there we go. That's an introduction to the uh, perils of intervention and uh, trying to document the case that uh, business uh, far too often is at the forefront of uh, government intervention rather than just the victim. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions, and we have how many uh, minutes? Almost 15 minutes for Okay. Time. So, first of all, thanks for a great talk. And, um, if you have questions, just come up to the microphone and ask them and try to keep them in the form of a uh, question. So, uh, and on you go. Yes, sir. I, I, think, I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, the recent Supreme Court decision about uh, political contributions, while on the one hand, it's very good that there's no limit to how much a man can spend or a private corporation could spend to, uh, to uh, promote its political uh, ideas, even uh, to as political contributions, it's a major mistake to give public corporations the the managers are given a hundred percent action and view, right to act and to talk, while not a hundred percent of the shareholders have a say about it. It's just like when you buy a share in a corporation, it should not give you, you should not lose the right to your privacy at your home. The corporation managers cannot come into your home and sit in your lobby just because you bought a share. I, I maintain that uh, uh, public corporations should seek 100%, not less than 100% of agreement of the shareholders to talk and act with political contributions. Uh, what's your view about it? Because I think it's, it, it brings about a lot of new problems into political capitalism. Uh, that's an interesting question, and uh, maybe uh, one of the talks tomorrow will address it. Um, um, uh, there's, a, there's a real question, what should a corporation uh, uh, do? Uh, and one answer is, if you're a shareholder and you don't like what the corporation's doing, then you sell the sh uh, stock. Uh, uh, Don't buy that. Well, be smarter next time and don't invest in political companies. Uh, Professor Hicks. Uh, you mentioned that uh, leftists like us are also uh, in despair over the marriage of uh, politics and business. Uh, we know that our solution is to separate politics from economics uh, as much as we can. But in your reading, what is the leftist solution to the problem of, of this incestual political capitalism, rather? And I don't mean the, the far left but rather kind of mainstream American left. How would they try to solve the problem? Well, uh, by having a romantic view of government, which a lot of them do. The textbooks have the romantic view of government. Government is us, uh, government officials do the right thing. Uh, and the real world is, uh, is uh, very different. Uh, I think uh, uh, folks on the left uh, the mild left or the hard left. They have to swallow hard because they love government intervention, but you can't really have government intervention and not expect corporate interest to be uh, uh, very involved in that. And, and one example is all this green energy, all these subsidies, you know, to the Enrons of yesterday and the uh, Solyndras uh, of today. It's just, uh, it's, a, it's a very bitter, pill for them to swallow, I think that's one of the arguments we have to, uh, to say, and I think Ron Paul and others are saying it uh, um, on a national political level, is uh, uh, really a fair field, no favor, uh, uh, is the best uh, solution to tame uh, corporate excesses. Have, uh, any other questions? If not, I'll take the moderator's uh, uh, opportunity to ask one. 
Um, what we've seen in the last uh, couple of years is, uh, again, as you say, especially the left talking about crony capitalism, the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, talked about uh, that and, and, and uh, you know, of course, after the bank bailouts and you had this weird situation where both sides were saying we don't like bank uh, bailouts. However, it seems to me and a lot of people that right now the public is extremely confused about these sorts of issues. What's the difference between crony capitalism, what you and I would say are re is real free market capitalism? How do you see the public knowledge uh, you know, either advancing or deteriorating over the last uh, uh, few years, because this has been a central uh, point of discussion in the public dialogue uh, of late. Well, the very term cronyism that uh, has become so popular, um, uh, some want to use that to mean uh, rent-seeking, political capitalism. And to me, there's cronyism uh, even in a free market uh, business. Uh, bad decision making, uh, where the where the, it really gets to the principal agent problem, where the uh, managers the uh, of the corporation are acting in a way that uh, uh, just isn't very fruitful. And with Aubrey McClendon of Chesapeake, uh, he was a real rent seeker, using a lot of his corporate uh, funds to uh, subsidize the Sierra Club, twenty six million dollars to the Sierra Club to try to shut down coal plants because McClendon's uh, natural gas uh, uh, was a rival in generating electricity. Uh, at the same time, Audrey McClendon is doing all these things and his uh, complacent board of directors uh, isn't policing them. Uh, and so there's cronyism externally and there's cronyism internally. So, I, you know, capitalism needs to clean up its act internally too. And I think uh, shareholders are really wising up to uh, opportunities to do that, uh, but uh, I think we're going to need a new breed of business leader, uh, sort of the John Allisons, the Charles Cokes, the Lee Raymonds, to come out and really differentiate what a free market business is to their uh, politically imbued uh, rivals, and I think that'll help the public debate. Uh, this may be an inappropriate question, but it's one that kind of burns at my core. Uh, how do, do we uh, continue to leave uh, Chris Dodd and Franks uh, exist out of jail for what they've done to the uh, home industry and, and the manipulations that went on there? And what's the question? I, I'm wondering how, how they can continue to function uh, with impunity when uh, when they made such a mess of the loan industry. Now, this is a diff different than corporations that you're talking about, but will that be discussed tomorrow, possibly? I have no particular comment on that. Uh, they uh, well, actually, as members of Congress, they can vote, you know, whatever they want, and if Congress goes along with it, you know, no matter how stupid it is, uh, you know, they're immune from their votes. Um, one of the questions, one of the things you mentioned during your talk is uh, Mitt Romney making use of uh, Hillary's quote during perhaps the uh, battle to come. Uh, do you have a good sense of Mitt Romney's record with regards to the whole issue of uh, this topic? Is he in like Massachusetts? Was he, uh, you know, pretty good about preventing this kind of cronyism? Uh, what cronyism in particular? Well, any kind of, uh, you know, corporate cronyism, which uh, they might have been... Yeah, I, I really know. don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't think he's uh, distinguished himself one way or the other. That's, yeah, I haven't he's heard in the, He's in the muddled middle. Okay. <laughs> well, that's, that's to be expected, I guess. Okay. <laughs> any, other, uh, any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, we're... Oh, wait, one more? Okay, here we go. Hey there, I'm Rod Gonzalez from Florida. I just want to make a quick comment about the Koch brothers. They're wonderful. I work closely with uh, Americans for Prosperity down in Florida, trying to combat big government. And I must say, we're putting their money to very good use. So we're very appreciative of them. Uh, you know, I wonder where we would be without uh, the philanthropy of Charles Koch. I, I started benefiting from his philanthropy in the 1970s by getting to go to summer seminars, summer groups uh, like this, and all the groups that he's founded 
in the different areas, uh, um, and now the, some of the support going to groups like yours, um, I'm just not sure whether we would be able to respond the way we have, and hopefully we will continue to respond uh, if Charles Koch didn't exist. And what's amazing about him is he really, as the CEO, created the wealth that then he's redistributing uh, uh, to the movement. Uh, so he's going, going from his company to saving the country, and it's an amazing story, and we're going to appreciate it, I think, a lot more in future years and decades than we do now just living through it. Uh, I have a question related with uh, one of the last slides of Milton Friedman comments. Can you explain the point of view about corporate social responsibility and how they affect? Because one of the last slides were, were, was a, a comment of Friedman about that. Uh -huh. So nowadays, how, how, how is that affected, like the business environment? with the corporate social responsibility movement that all the business require to have, that yeah, social well, part? Uh, corporate social responsibility normally means a business needs to do all sorts of things to please everybody. Not only customers, but your workers. Uh, uh, be very active uh, to you know, save this or that. Uh, it's sort of business as, uh, as as charity and not only as a profit-seeking entity. And uh, Elaine Stern Sternberg and other uh, business uh, ethicists have emphasized that a business that tries to be all things is just not uh, going to be successful and it's not a business. The whole idea of business is to make a profit. And Milton Friedman was very effective in his 1970 article by uh, emphasizing this, that if a business is making a profit, it is inherently doing a lot of good things, but the problem is, uh, is how is it making its profit? And, and Friedman talked about, well, a uh, business needs to respect ethical norms and that sort of thing. Well, the ethical norm today is to rent seek, okay? So, uh, and Friedman got pressed on it and he said, you know, I don't like it, but yeah. You know, to make a profit, sometimes you have to get government favor, and I'm not one to say that uh, business, you know, can't do that, can't help their shareholders. So Charles Koch's principled entrepreneurship really cre uh, corrects that, and that's a standard, I think, that uh, we can rally around. Okay. That takes us just about up to the end. I want to thank Rob Bradley for an interesting talk, and I think you're going to be around for another talk, and uh, anyone wants to uh, talk to him? Thank you very much.